Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another Failures Anonymous. Um, this is actually take two because we already had an interview with Isabella. And uh, unfortunately, Facebook decided that it's not good enough quality and they deleted it from from Facebook. So this time recording it so that it will stay with us forever. Um, so yeah. Hey, hi, Isabella. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much. After almost two weeks of not really vacation, but a lot of traveling, I'm back and ready to rock it again. <laughs> okay. Was it for business? It was partly business and, and partly family vacation and some time with my husband. So nice. it was both. <laughs> I needed nice. to, to get away after the business. <laughs> okay. Um, well, as you already know the drill, we first dive into, into the failures. Um, and uh, feel free to pick any one of the failures from your past that you want to talk about today. Failures is always such a strong word for me. I don't like to identify with it because really what it means for me is a misalignment. And so when I think of failure, the, the things that really show up is when, or that, that comes to mind, the stories that come to mind right away is when I uh, first started out my whole journey of coming here to the U.S. For those who are heard about me for the first time, I'm originally from Germany. And um, I grew up, I was born and grew up in Germany, and I had this prophetic dream at the age of 12 that I somehow, some way, sometime had to move to the U.S. And so I did, but I was so attached to that dream that that attachment led to failure or misalignment, how I would say it. So the worst, I think, was um, when... Well, I wouldn't say the worst, but the most um, significant was when I was in the U.S. for an exchange year when I was 18, and I went back to Germany. And because of that attachment to my dream, I figured this is the, the easiest way to go back to the U.S. So I studied economics, which is absolutely not for me. Anyone who hears me and can um, relate to me, math, accounting, yeah, I knew that. I knew that, and I still did it. And it led me to an absolute breakdown. I started to have anxiety, depression, panic attacks. I literally failed exams to the point that I got kicked out of university. After two years, I got this really nice, pretty letter that said, unfortunately, you will not be able to come back for this next semester for this and this and this reason. And I was at this point already a year older, two years older than all the other normal students. So I was like, oh gosh, I already lost a lot of time. I still don't have a degree. I have to start over again. I don't really have a family. I haven't had a job yet when most of my friends already had a career or started a career. So that was, I think, one of the biggest downfalls and misalignments because I didn't listen to myself and what I knew was good for me and trust in the process because I thought if I study economics, especially international economics, I will definitely get a job in the U.S. and be able to live out that prophetic dream that I had at the age of 12. So that was a really very significant failure where I didn't trust my intuition and where I ended up physically and mentally and emotionally to rock bottom. Like I hit rock bottom right there and didn't even know where to go. I really felt like a failure. I felt lost. I was um, not happy at all. I, I, I didn't know what to do with my life at this point. So that's definitely one. I'm sure that, I mean, there are a lot of more. <laughs> um, that, okay. that is one. Um, very yeah, but... <clears throat> If, if we die, uh, dive a little bit deeper into this one, mm -hmm. so um, you got that letter, and then what? I broke down. I totally broke down because at this point, my dream sh was shattered. I didn't know or couldn't think of another way how I could live out that dream that I had because it kept coming back and coming back. I got into a really bad relationship because of that, because I thought, well, maybe the relationship is what will get me there. And um, it just went from, from one bad decision to the next, to the next, and to the next. And I guess the, the, 
the letter wasn't quite the worst at this point for me to stop and say, maybe I should learn from this um, and listen to myself more. But I, at this point, I didn't know what I was doing wrong, what I was not seeing, what I, not, what I was not able to understand about who I am and what I'm called to do. And I guess I didn't quite know what trust means either. So after I got that letter, it just, I, I started to continue the vicious cycle of doing one decision after another that wasn't in alignment with where, with, with who I am, literally with who I am. Okay. Um, if we go to that time, can mm -hmm. you remember what were, you know, what were some of the feelings, some of the emotions, maybe a bit of the self-talk, I'm guessing it was quite negative, the self-talk, um, and, and dive a little bit more into that. Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the emotional part was an absolute roller coaster. It got to the point where even just dropping a spoon made me bawl. I cried. I freaked out just by dropping a spoon, which is totally ridiculous if you think about it. Um, but like everything, if I just got a call from, from the doctor, which didn't say anything, just, hey, we need to reschedule the appointment, I cried. I, like what comes to my mind, or I think the self-talk that I still remember is, I can't do anything right. Nothing is ever going to work out. Maybe I'm holding on to the wrong dreams. I, I need to prove, because I, I'm the oldest of five too, and I wanted to prove to my family that I still can do it. So I wasn't even open about sharing anything. I just like, yeah, I'm just going to pretend everything is fine. I'll figure things out. Everything is how it's supposed to be until the point where the noise in my head was unidentifiable. Like it was just noise and I couldn't stop it. I couldn't sleep at night anymore. I couldn't think clear to the point where I realized that I crossed the street without even noticing or wanting to notice cars like for me it was like well if when someone hits me well, well whatever um doesn't bother me like anything on the outside didn't really bother me anymore it, it didn't matter and that's when i woke up and and i had this car stopping next to me and i woke up and i looked at him and i was like something needs to happen and the next step i did was i went actually and and saw a doctor and i asked for help and and that's when things started to change where she really looked at me and was like, okay, what is actually your story? What is your head talk? And like I said, as the oldest of five, you always want to be that role model. You always want to be better. You want to show something. You want to prove something. And I didn't deliver. And so that was my, I don't deliver. I don't have anything to show. I don't have anything accomplished so far. And at that point, I was 24, 25. And when you get to the point, you feel like pretty much, okay, I will never figure life out. <laughs> and um, that's when I ask for help. So that's pretty much was the, the talk that was going on. And yeah, the emotional, just really down and, and sad and angry at the same time. I think it's pretty much how you can explain that is when you have like the highest voltage going through your body, meaning that you feel all of the emotions within just five minutes. Who did you ask for help? My dad. First, um, it was my, my doctor, and then I asked my dad. Because my dad does similar work I do today, and he back then um, worked for a um, hotline, like a, where people can call if they have any issues. It's anonymous. And so he knew about the psychology, and he knew what was going on. And at first, he didn't quite believe me. He kind of was like, yeah, it's just a phase. You're going to be fine until I got and went to the doctor and, and got some medication for a while, just for very long, but just to get out of the funk. And then I asked my dad and he came and stayed with me for, I think, a week or two. And um, interestingly enough, I think he's also very in tune or intuitive, meaning he took me for walks every single day. And back then I didn't know that I'm highly sensitive. I didn't understand that what I feel was even more intensified with who I am. So going for walks with him was the best thing I could ever do because it connected me with nature and helped me to ground again, to center my balance 
um, just to become more clear. So he was the one who really helped me through that and helped me to take the next step. And that's when I started taking, um, applying for universities to get into sociology and psychology. I was, I actually, they got me right in. Um, so I was able to, to start again the following semester. So I knew that this is exactly what I wanted to do, but for whatever reason, I rebelled against it thinking with what I'm really passionate about, I won't be able to fulfill in my dream. Okay. Um, how long was this whole, uh, uh, from, from you getting that letter to when your father arrived and then how things changed and you were accepted? Mm -hmm. I think, um, let's see, it was probably about half a year. Because I got the letter right before the end of that semester. So it must have been somewhere around February, March. And the next semester started uh, in September, October. So it's, it was about a half a year. It continued. Even with the new um, studying, with the new major, I had to start over in a different city. I, I, was, I was still in my head. I wasn't... I didn't feel powerful at all. I felt like this little child that you just sit somewhere, you drop them off at kindergarten and you don't know what to do. <laughs> so there, there was still work that needed to be continued for me to get out of my head and not to experience myself as failure and to get my strength back, especially emotionally. But the major part of this whole phase was about six, six months. Okay. Um, so what was... I mean, what would you say was the aha moment? Uh, can, was there a moment like that when, when, when things started to become clearer and, or clear and you, from that moment on, you knew exactly what your next step should be or what, at least how you want to proceed with your life? I think at that point, you don't, you know, when you're so much in your head that at some point you get so tired and exhausted that you don't even have strength to push against anything or push through anything. You just like, whatever happens, happens. That is kind of a way of surrendering. And so I was at that point. I didn't have the strength to fight. I didn't have the strength to, to even dream. I just wanted to make it through and figure something out. But when you get at that point, it's almost like, okay, thank you. Like it's, it's almost like God saying, thank you. Now I can do my work. So slowly but surely I realized, okay, actually it's not all that bad. So for example, I was able to finish my degree in three years instead of four. I finished most of my classes in the top because I was so passionate about the topic and I was able to do half of those classes in English as well. So that helped me too to feel more of that confirmation. And, and then I started to volunteer and then later work for the university with the international students and I totally love that. So really involving myself with other people and understanding who they are got me away from me. <laughs> from just thinking about me and what's going on in my head and seeing the bigger picture. And just for them to acknowledging me and saying, hey, you're doing great work, I love, like they, I was usually the, work, the first on their list to contact if something happened because they really trusted me. So focusing on other people helped me to get out of my funk as well and to overcome the, the self-talk, the failure self-talk. Like um, at that point I was 26, and I was like, what am I supposed to do with my life now? Like, what is it? And um, it didn't honestly really click until I went through coaching training, which was about two years after I moved back to the U.S. I already was married at that point. And so, as you can tell, between the time, a lot of things came into place that eventually had me, had this all work out. But when I went through coaching training, when they were really, really direct with me and like literally pulled everything off of me and I felt so naked, that's when I understood that every time looking back, I felt myself in, the, in that self-talk, in that failure mode. I wasn't in alignment. I didn't trust myself. I didn't listen. I didn't even take the time to listen of what I am supposed to do and what I am called to do. So it really didn't click until years later, which is kind of sad to be honest. 
um, <laughs> years later that I'm like, oh my gosh, if I look back, everything, every time things didn't work out, every time I had this self-talk, it was that time when I didn't trust myself, when I didn't let go, when I tried to control everything, when I was so attached to how I think things are supposed to work out. It's like that that egocentric, um, that I know everything best and how things are supposed to work out, right? But when I, once I let go of that thought, that's when it really clicked for me, when I was like, I cannot control everything. I have to listen and really connect internally with my soul to understand my, my purpose and my calling. And that's what I'm saying. I don't like the term failure per se, which makes sense though. But for me, it was that misalignment because I was so focused. So it took yeah. me a while. As I said, it's a little sad. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you know, in the end, it counts that uh, you you were able to emerge on the other side of the tunnel. Yes, I just wish it would have gone a little faster. Sometimes <laughs> looking back, it's like, all right. But at the same time, it got me where I am today. Like the understanding, knowing what I've gone through, a lot of especially young people go through when they're being thrown out in, in the cold water with now go live your own life and figure it out kind of like, I don't know what to do with it. It's all life. It's crazy, you know. So having that story where people say, yeah, I can relate to that. I understand it. So please help me to get out of that situation. If, I don't think if I would have gone through it, if everything would have worked out right away, I wouldn't be able to, to work and support the people that I do today. Exactly. Um, I mean, uh, a lot of people made fun, especially uh, the branding experts and the marketing mm. experts when I named my company fail coach, like nobody wants a fail coach. Everybody wants to be successful. You know, the, the funny thing, a lot of people connect with that because they say, Oh, uh, look, somebody who is actually not all about Lambos and showing just the yeah. shiny side of the business, but who actually did fail himself as well and 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 they they want to work with me so yeah um yeah i think no matter how successful you are you still fail i'm gonna i'm gonna be real honest with you like just the last two weeks i went to a amazing summit and everyone was like all hyped up and i'm the person after i leave a summit i have a really low like for me it's like at first, I'm like, everything is going really great. You know, it's awesome. I got all those articles published and all my clients. It's really great. My business is awesome. And then I go to the summit and I see those speakers and I see the dreams of the other people. And I, I, I totally plummet it. Like, it's like, oh, maybe my business isn't so great after all. Maybe I'm not doing the things that I'm supposed to do. Maybe I should put more focus on this side. And I had to work through that again, even with all the practice after all those years. I mean, it's been almost 10 years. Um, I had to go through them. Okay, it's not the truth. It just comes up because you're comparing yourself. So what would you say to yourself if you don't compare yourself? Where are you at? Like, oh, I guess it's just a need that needs to be acknowledged. And so I took the last week mostly off because I knew that this was going to come, like that I would have this, this down. But like Sean T always says, um, the down is just the, the, oh, how does he say it now? I forgot it. I just had it. Um, the down is just propelling you up. It's like a roller coaster. When you go down, it propels you back up, right? And you just have to acknowledge that. So I did have to do some work. I'm like, okay. Um, actually, when, when your vision is gone, when you feel like, I don't know how to move forward, it's pretty much just a sign for you to just embrace the, the moment in the present. And the present and that's um that's hard like even for me having practiced that for so many years I'm like but i need to do something because everyone else is doing something they all post about it why am i not doing something you know and that is even just current i mean that's just been the last two weeks so no matter how successful you are you still have things like that show up you just are able to work through it much much faster like 10 years ago that would have taken me months to make it through and to get myself back up now it's Oh yeah, it's a need. I need to just recoup and just rejuvenate because it was a lot of energy. I'm going to be fine. My business is still great. My business is still here. I still have all my clients. Nothing happened. Nothing changed, you know? 
and it's just been current. So no matter where you're at, and we all have that word failure stuck in our head because you always set the the goal a little higher, the standard a little higher. You have more expectations on yourself. And so I, I don't think you ever lose that feeling, but you can recreate your relationship to what you experience. I found it that what really works for me, is, but it took me years to, to really start living that, mm-hmm. is focusing on the process and you know, just realizing that um, everything can be achieved if the process is correct. If I'm not achieving the desired results, then I need to just focus on the process make it better, learn something new or add somebody to my team or find a new coach Mm -hmm. or or something. But I'm always just focused on the process, polishing the process because, but but yeah, it took me a lot of time to really, you know, be okay with uh, what will happen, will happen. Um, Many people before me have done that. So it is possible. It is doable. It's not a question whether it's for me or not for me. It's just a question of doing the right process. So I just focus on the process and then you don't get overwhelmed with thinking about the outcome and focusing on the outcome and so on. But yeah, it takes a lot of time to not just say it, but to really live that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I have to admit, like even focusing on the process for me, it doesn't work very well because I'm not, um, well, actually I use, apparently I use both brain hemispheres equally or almost equally, yet my drive is more of the creative, intuitive, emotional side of me. So when it comes to the analytical side, the, the logical side, which goes hand in hand with process, it overwhelms me because um, those are the things that add on to my stress. And I think it's, it's especially people who are very sensitive can relate to that. Like what you said is, is works really well. And I see that with my clients, especially those who are more analytical driven that use more of the, the brain hemisphere that is the logical thinking. For them, it's a, a distraction. For me, it would be an overwhelm. And so sometimes really to, to look through or to go through that is to acknowledge your needs. It's like, okay, what do I do? Um, or what do I need? Where am I at? What is in front of me? Where can I, what can I focus on? Sometimes it's literally just sitting outside. I'm like, okay, there are orange flowers. By the way, I'm just saying what's out in front of my window. There are sitting some pumpkins. There's a beautiful tree and the lake and the green is still, the grass is still green. Like, those things just bring you back into focus and like, okay, all right, now I'm here. What are my needs? And that was in my case, just plug, unplug and trust the process. But like you said, I think the underlying um, found the foundation of all of that from your um, view and from my view is trust. Um, if it's trusting the going with, your needs like what works for you versus the trust of if i do take that next step it i'm gonna be fine like for me even when i find myself in that stage of failure mind um i i pick one thing that i really love doing for example right now it's writing so i just sit down and do that one thing i write one article even if it's not perfect i just write it and then send it to someone else to edit it <laughs> because in that state, usually it's, it's a little bit confusing when I write, but I do what I'm passionate about. And once I have it down, I feel better. I start to feel emotionally like the, the vibration is, is getting higher and I start to feel better. And then I can implement the process easier because then it doesn't overwhelm me. So I think, um, it's great that we talk because we can talk to two different personalities or like people that again, more with the intuitive, um, more intuitively driven and those who are more logically driven. So it, yeah. So I think people just have to figure out what works for them better. Is it better for me to just implement things to get out or is it better for me to just check in and unplug and just really pay attention to my mental state? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, okay, so we dived into the failures. We dived into the emotions. Um, now, can, we, can you walk us 
to the to the to the light uh, <laughs> on, on the other side of the tunnel. So um, you started uh, doing the steps. You started working on to, uh, to into achieving what your desire was. Um, how did all that result in who you are today and what you do today? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to with the coaching training because um, that's what really made the biggest um, impact on me. I think looking back, the time before that was kind of that surviving mode. As long as I can continue swimming, as long as I can keep my head up, I'm going to be fine. But I was always out of breath. And I was always wondering what is next and how and why. So once I went through that, through the coaching training and they coached us the same way as we are being taught to coach our clients, um, it was painful. I really I hated them and loved them at the same time. It was very interesting. But um, what happened was that I started to allow things to happen. Instead of making things happen, I allowed them to happen. I was more in alignment with what I know really works for me. Um, one of one of my coaches is like, I'm going to challenge you to only take divinely inspired action. I'm like, no, I can't do that because I need to answer all those emails. I need to create the systems and I need to write the, the funnels. And I don't know what else. He's like, only take divine guided or inspired action. I'm like, oh gosh, I can't do that. And But I started to do that. And I realized the more I really followed my heart, the more success showed up. Um, either the right people that I connected with or I got amazing applications for people working with me, wanting to work with me. I'm like, yes, I love them. But it's because when you allow, you start to increase your vibration. I can even explain it physically. We all have an electro, a bioelectromagnetic field around us, right? And depending on where you're at, usually um, you measure it in, in hertz. So a normal where people feel kind of pretty much normal, like they don't feel sick or anything, is between 58 and 65 hertz. Anything above that is considered enlightenment, the awakened state, where you're so connected that you're melting in with your environment, literally. That's usually the meditative state. When you're under 58, that's when your frequency is very low. That's when you're able to be attacked. Usually it shows up as, oh, I'm starting to have a cold or I really have this headache going on or like you just start to feel really miserable. And the more you talk yourself into it, the more you focus on that, the lower it gets. So when I started to allow things happening, I saw the beauty of things, no matter how I felt. But the more I acknowledged the, the beauty and the, it comes in the gratitude, right? We've, I think we've talked about that too a couple of times before. And not in this interview, but in general. Yeah, um, yeah. When, when we allow the gratitude just for the little things, like, oh, this, this plant in front of me is really beautiful. You start to raise your frequency again automatically. And that's when you start to attract the right people, when you have the inspired thoughts, like suddenly the most amazing art comes out of your hands, or you have a fabulous interview going on, and from there you have people wanting to connect with you. That's where I wanted to get, and that's what I achieved once I allowed. It literally was get naked, and then we're going to put the pretty stuff on you, <laughs> like the pretty clothes that really fit you, that are not too baggy, that are not too tight on you. You know, those things. A really good example, um, I always, I love um, scarves. If you ask my husband, they're all in my closet. Like I have a whole list of them and I'll call her. It's really funny. But um, when I went to the coaching training, I had it really tight, almost like a, um, a um almost like a cast around my neck, like if I would have a head injury. <laughs> and okay. they said to me, like, why are you doing this? Like, why, why is your scarf so tied around your throat? I'm like, oh, no, it's cold outside. That's why. And I'm like, nah. Well, we dug a little deeper, and it was a protection, um, a subconscious protection of myself, of my um, throat chakra, of my voice, how I wanted to be hurt. I protected that. And throughout the, the year, um, they took that scarf off. I was not allowed to wear it again, by the way. Um, but throughout that year of training, I started to see how I couldn't even 
keep it tight anymore. Like even here, this has a lot of room uh, because I can't have anything tied to my throat anymore because I found my voice. And those are little things that we do. That's why I say they stripped me naked. They took off the clothes that didn't fit and put on the ones that really fit me um, literally and, and um, fictionally. Like, <laughs> um, so you can use as an example, but it was really beautiful to see the picture that they took of me in the very beginning and the picture that they took of me of the last day. It was the transformation was incredible and the scarf was, I still love my scarves. I will not throw them away. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> sorry, not sorry, but they are not tight around my neck anymore because I can't have it because I found my voice. And that's kind of a really good example how, how I got out there where I really found my voice. And I, this is who I am. I was standing up for that. Even if, the midst of a feeling of failure, like I said, last two weeks were a little bit rough, like just in my mind, but I, I know who I am today. So it's easy for me to get up there. So it was, it was quite the transformation for me to, to get to the light and say, you know, all you sometimes have to do is to allow life to work with you instead of you continuously fighting against because you're so in your head. Yeah, that's really nicely said. So before we close this interview with the last question. Uh, who are you today? What do you do? Who can reach out to you? Where can they find you? Who I am today is, um, I would probably say I am. <laughs> and then I am bold, I'm strong, I am valued, I'm loved. So um, those are some of the indications of who I am. Um, what I do is um, I'm an inspirational speaker. I love to speak on the stage um, on the topic of emotional health, emotional healing, especially and recreating our uh, relationship to emotions and bringing in back the spiritual with the scientific and how we experience emotions. But I'm also the founder of the ICU movement, meaning my gift that I have discovered through the coaching is being able to read people's hearts. People call me the leader's heart decoder, meaning that my brain translates everything into color. Really awesome. I don't see it physically. It's all in my brain. Like some people have it where everything turns into music or uh, I don't know what else is out there, but it actually is, is something that's um, scientifically proven. And because the heart has the highest vibration, I can just tune in with people and see the dominant color and each color has a specific meaning. It's amazing and very um, inspiring work for me because I can see a lot of things that people under different circumstances wouldn't see. So I don't see the color of your skin. I don't see what you do. Your heart for me is so loud that I can see the rest. And so I teach people how to emotionally connect on an intercultural level so that we acknowledge how we feel with each other instead of what we see and how we communicate. But I'm also a, a transformation coach working with highly, highly sensitive visionaries and um, world changers that I call empath warriors. And I'm also an emotions clearing practitioner and the author of my, uh, my book, The Power of Faith Driven Success and two times Amazon bestselling co-author. So quite some things going on for me, but that's pretty much what I do and how I work with people. Okay. <clears throat> how can they get in touch with you? I keep it very simple. Like I said, I get overwhelmed quickly and most of my clients do too. So I keep everything on my website, isabelhunt.com. It's I-S-A-B-E-L-H-U-N-D-T.com um, where you can find ways how to work with me, how to join my group, World Visionaries United, amazing people in the group, um, where to get my book. It's by the way on Amazon too. So you can just Look it up on Amazon. But I have everything on my website. If you need just one place to go, you pretty much just have to type my website into your window and you will get there and you can find all the information about me, how to book me for speaking, how to work with me, all the fun stuff. Perfect. Okay, and now for the last question. Failure is anonymous. So uh, what's the one thing that you want the audience to take away from this interview or your one thing that you would like to tell them when it comes to failure, facing failure? Mm -hmm. The one thing, and I think I've mentioned it a few times, 
But if you can recreate or reestablish your relationship to failure and turn it into misalignment and become more reflective instead of reactive to what is happening to you and within you, you're more likely to work through and to walk through what is going on right now much faster than if you continue to hold on to the stories that you connect to, I am a failure. Because what you experience is not who you are. You experience it as failure, but you are not that. So I think literally just changing it to where am I not in alignment with myself? And that takes some getting to know yourself, but it takes off the pressure. So I think that's something that I want people to understand and to know and to really ingrain, like, I'm not a failure. What I experience doesn't define me. Amazing. I like it. Um, I, and I agree a lot with it. Well, Isabel, thank you. Thank you for doing this again. Um, and this time it won't get lost in the Facebook universe. <laughs> uh, thank you for taking the time again, and uh, yeah, as even it was from my the pleasure. yeah from and I think the last it ended interview, up being different, anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it for sure was. Uh, every time it's a little bit different. We are not using any script, so yeah.